G'day everyone, we're Krista and Tony, a couple of Australians that have taken a year off to travel the world. Starting our travels in America, we've rented a van for 60 days as we head up the west coast up to Canada. In this episode, we drive through Yellowstone National Park, showing you where to camp and where the best geysers are in the park. We also show you the incredible Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, while rushing to escape Yellowstone from a once in 500 year flood which sadly devastated the park. We first started our trip into Yellowstone from the south entrance after visiting the Grand Tetons in our previous episode. This drive was about 40 to 60 minutes from the Tetons to the entrance of the park where we stopped for a brief cup of tea while checking out the wildlife. This is where we saw a beaver just casually floating past along with a small fox crossing the road, with zero fox given. Next stop was Moose Falls which is worth a quick look in if you have time on your way through the park. This waterfall is bigger than it looks, and it's an easy two minute walk from the road. Remember though, this is bear country, so carry bear spray at all times. Can't see any bears, can't see any moose, just a waterfall. But because Yellowstone is so massive, taking about two and a half hours to drive from one section of the park to the other, I split it into three different sections. The incredible deep blue geysers in the west, and the mud volcanoes and Yellowstone Grand Canyon in the east. Then Mammoth Hot Springs to the north. We started our trip to the west because we knew this would be the best day weather-wise, which is where you find the world-famous Old Faithful Geyser and Grand Prismatic Spring. So we started our geyser hunting with Old Faithful and Upper Geyser Boardwalk loops, which is shown in yellow and red on this map. This trail takes an hour or two to see the highlights. So here we are, we made it to Yellowstone. It was like an hour drive from the south of the park. Heaps of potholes on the road. Uh, we got here about 9 o'clock and it wasn't that busy on a Thursday, so... Friday. Ah, oh, it's Friday. <laughs> Some of the highlights along this boardwalk include Doublet Pool, which is 8 feet deep and its temperatures are around 194 Fahrenheit, which is about 90 degrees Celsius. Spasmonic geyser can have eruptions coming from both pools that can be up to 15 feet high. Next pool we recommend is Crested Pool which looks like an incredible tempting spa, but I'd give jumping in a miss as its extreme heat prevents most bacterial growth, resulting in exceptionally clear blue water. This is Grotto Geyser. Apparently it's got a bit of a cone because it was built around some dying trees, geologists predict or think or... Oh, no, I'm just reading the sign to be honest. So we started heading back to Old Faithful, but then something was blocking the path. He's just like, well, what am I going to do now? <laughs> he's just frozen. I feel really bad for him. Yeah, he's frozen, but I also need to go to the bathroom, which is on the other side of that bison. He's not have frozen. Stay back. The bison's on the road. Don't get near them. Let them themselves. Nah, thank God the bison's finally moving. Okay. And now I can run to the visitor center and go to the bathroom. <laughs> So after seeing several geysers going off around us, followed by the sound of running water, we absolutely legged it for the Old Faithful Inn. This place is the most popular hotel in the park. Being over 100 years old, this log cabin was designed to reflect the similar asymmetry to that seen in nature. Not to mention there's also a bathroom in the lobby. Final stop in this section was Old Faithful itself, where this natural geyser is world famous for erupting pretty much every 45 minutes to an hour. The famous geyser currently erupts around 20 times a day and can be predicted with up to 90% confidence rate with a 10 minute variation. So the next cluster of pools and geysers worth visiting are a few minutes up the road at Black Sand Basin where there is a short boardwalk to pools such as Rainbow Pool which is pretty big at around 100 feet across. Next door you also have Emerald Pool which used to be bright blue. But due to recent drop in temperatures, bacterial growth has increased, making it slightly change colour. So, as I'm a geology expert and I just read the sign in front of us, this is the old caldera rim, where half a million years ago, a big massive volcano erupted and created Yellowstone National Park. This caldera rim can actually be seen over a large area as can be seen from the yellow dotted line on this map. Yellowstone National Park is situated on top of a very volcanic active zone, 
which is renowned for its multiple volcanic eruptions over its history. Some of the largest eruptions would have resulted from a build-up in pressure beneath the surface from a potential blockage, where pressure would become so great, a massive explosion would have resulted in creating the caldera we see today. This is actually pretty well depicted in the Apocalypse movie 2012, with Yellowstone's supervolcano blowing its lid. Another caldera forming eruption is theoretically possible, but it's very unlikely in the next thousand or even ten thousand years. But it's still a pretty scary thought. So after we checked out the surrounding caldera, we headed north for Grand Prismatic Spring. However, as it was in the middle of the day when the park's at its busiest, we couldn't find a parking spot. So we just continued on to check out the Fountain Paint Pot Trail. This includes Celestine Pool, which is infamous for an incident involving a man diving into the boiling pool in an attempt to save a dog named Moosey that escaped his leash, which sadly didn't turn out well for either of them. Next door is the Deep Blue Silex Spring, which is named for the large amount of silica found in and around the pool. Silex is Latin for silica, which comes up from the underlying volcanic rocks when dissolved in the hot waters. Right next door to Silex was the Mud Paint Pots. This one's called Fountain Paint Pots, which is pretty cool. Little mud bath. So these mud pots, apparently it's quite new. There used to be a parking lot just over there where there's some old concrete. And then an artist decided to paint Yellowstone and then they left all their paint stuff behind and then this happened. I don't think that's, I don't think that's what... <laughs> This geological feature was actually created by heat-loving bacteria called thermophiles. You gonna get in? These thermophiles thrive on gases emitted by the underground vent, creating sulfuric acid as a byproduct, which then dissolves the surrounding rock and turns it into mud. Two seconds away is another mud pool known as Red Spouter, which was formed as a direct result of the 1959 Hebgen Lake earthquake. With this vent opened up, swallowing some of the nearby footpath and parkland, so once we checked out all the mud pots, we then boosted back to the car and drove to Firehole Lake Loop to find a good spot for lunch. We quickly checked out the blue pool of Firehole Spring, then stopped for lunch at Lava Lake where Krista had a small nap overlooking the warm vents. Around 3pm the park started to quieten down, so we decided to head back to Grand Prismatic Spring and try our luck. So we just pulled over because we've just seen bison everywhere. They're so close to the road you can just go and take photos of them and say hello. Look at them, they're losing your winter coat. Yeah. I feel like they have like fluffy heads like this. Look. Can you see it? It's a bit more to the left. Where's my left? Is this left? Yay! Touching the bison! Bison are starting to recover from the 1800s when their populations were absolutely decimated. They were killed by the millions to the point that in 1901 there were only 25 wild bison left in Yellowstone. In 1902, a bison restoration program was put in place by Congress, where they have since recovered to around 4,500 that you can see in Yellowstone today. So to get there to Grand Prismatic Spring, you have to cross a bridge, which is pretty cool. Excelsior Geyser Crater is a huge crater that constantly discharges more than 15,000 litres of water per minute into the Firehole River. Just past the Blue Man Group, straight out of Vegas. So we finally made it to the Grand Prismatic Spring. It's the largest hot spring in the United States and the third largest in the world. And with the boardwalk, you can walk right up to it. But to be honest, because it's so big, the best way to see it is from above. Check out this aerial footage found on the Smithsonian Channel, where you can see its beautiful colours, with the deep blue colours in the middle with temperatures above boiling point, to the yellow-brown algal mats which are cooler in temperature. The best way to see this spring is from elevated heights, but drones were banned in the park after a German tourist flew his craft into the geyser back in 2014. So the best vantage point is from either helicopter ride or from Grand Prismatic Spring Overlook. To get to this overlook, you have to hike 1.6 miles return along the Fairy Falls Trail. So it concludes our tour of all the geysers. We pretty much saw all of them. Um, things we learned today, getting here early was the key because we avoided all the rush, which was pretty good. Um, and then middle of the day, lunchtime, it's best to just find a spot sit there for a couple of hours and have like a nice light, long lunch because it's just chaos in the middle of the day. And then, what time is it now? Um, nearly five. Yeah. But but people are starting to leave now, so that's... Oh, I'm climbing a hill. Oh. 
And you can see bisons everywhere. There's, bi there's bison everywhere, which is pretty cool. Um, and everyone starts to leave about five o'clock and the sun doesn't set till like nine. So you've got a bit of time to see the park still, especially if you're staying in one of the campgrounds within Yellowstone, which we are. And make sure you book in advance because everything's booked out. So we headed back to the van and started the drive back to our campsite for the night at Bridge Bay Campground. There are no free campsites in Yellowstone, so if you want a free site, you'll have to drive a fair distance out of the park to any nearby free BLM site, which I wouldn't recommend as you'll waste heaps of time and fuel driving in and out of the park. Campsites within the park are managed by both the National Park Service and by Yellowstone National Park Lodges, with all the combined campsites shown on the map. To check out what can be booked in advance and what is available, check out the links in the video description below. Not all these campsites will be available after the big storm that hit the park though, which we see firsthand later in this episode. We chose Bridge Bay Campground as they had reservations available, where most of the other campsites had already booked out, at a cost of 50 US dollars a night for an unpowered site that was close to the western side of the park. This site was very basic and some parts were pretty flooded due to all the snow melt, but it was a place for us to sleep for the night. So the next day we headed off to check out the mud volcanoes in the eastern side of Yellowstone, starting at Dragon's Mouth Spring. So we've just driven around Lake Tahoe and we're now on the eastern side of the park. Lake Tahoe? Yellowstone Lake and we're now at Dragon's Mouth Spring which is pretty cool. Back up until 1994 used to shoot water all the way to this boardwalk. I think it's calmed down a bit since then. It's still pretty cool. And here is the mud volcano. It smells like sulfur and is pretty gross. Next stop was the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. This massive canyon, carved out by the Yellowstone River, is over 1,200 feet deep. So what is this? It's the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. That's right. And that is Yellowstone Falls. I'm freezing. As we went to check out one of the many overlooks, we saw the weather started to take a really bad turn. We were supposed to spend another night in the park so we could take our time exploring. But after checking the weather report, we heard that a massive storm front was headed our way. As a result, we took the scenic northern road through the mountains and passed by Mammoth Hot Springs, where there was a lot of traffic also trying to leave the park. We luckily escaped just as the storm front hit. Those that didn't escape the park were trapped, as many of the roads we had just driven along were washed away by the once in 500 year flood that hit the park. This combination of torrential rainfall combined with a large level of snow melt caused many of the rivers to overflow and caused infrastructure to fail. We absolutely loved Yellowstone Park and it was so sad to hear about all the damage that occurred once we escaped. Good news is the park has now reopened after all that devastating flooding and they're currently repairing a lot of the damaged infrastructure. If you do plan on visiting Yellowstone, make sure you check the conditions of the roads and the camps on the National Park's website. And most importantly, check the weather. Thanks for watching this episode, everyone. We'll catch you in the next one. And don't forget, it helps our channel a lot if you subscribe and like. Bling.